Okay, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. Um, I wanted to start with a story about the importance of Asian Pacific American doctors and the difference you can make with one voice, one alternate perspective. Oops, wrong clicker. Okay. It's not, uh, wait, 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 wait. What did I do? It was working. Ah, there we go. Here we go. So this is my oldest daughter, Mango, when she was a few months old. Uh, when Mango was about nine months old, we moved back to Ann Arbor from Kathmandu and were assigned a new pediatrician, a resident, who was concerned that her weight was only 25th percentile. Now, the baby was obviously healthy and growing, uh, but to be sure, the pediatrician had us come in for monthly weight checks. We were nervous new parents, so of course, we did what we were told, even though we knew that she was healthy and thriving. I mean, look at that, right? So the young pediatrician had us force feeding her things like tablespoons of cream cheese to try to fatten her up. After a few months of worry, we happened to pass by her supervisor in the hallway. And her supervisor happened to be multiracial Japanese American woman who said, oh no, those weight charts are for white babies. Of course a Hapa baby is going to weigh less. But of course, that's not what the chart says at top, right? It says, you know, it's a weight chart. It doesn't say it's for white babies. So it was so obvious as soon as she said it. But before that, all my Asian American friends and I had been comparing our babies. Oh, mine's first percentile. What's yours? Oh, mine's third percentile. So mine was huge at 25 percentile. <laughs> we didn't know the right questions to ask. And it, but it only took one Asian American doctor to see. Similarly, it only took one doctor in Flint, plus an investigative reporter in a research university, to know the right question to ask about the water in Flint. Ironically, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha got the idea to test the children of Flint for blood lead, lead levels at a dinner party with a friend who happened to work at the EPA. Conversation, connection. Issues of race and class are so obvious once you see it. 57% of the people in Flint are African American, 42% live in poverty. Yet, until you see it, you, ha you, you have to know the right questions to ask. The undocumented immigrants in Flint did not even know about the lead in the water, likely because of language barriers, and they are afraid to get the free donations of water because distribution sites are asking for ID before they give out the water. And today it was in the news that there's an outbreak of TB in Alabama, another very poor African-American neighborhood. Meanwhile, the guys in Oregon are going on three weeks and still asking for snacks. <laughs> As young Asian Pacific American medical students, you stand at the confluence of history and family and cultures with so much privilege and so much potential. Anything is possible, but it takes courage and intention. You are so important to our communities and to our future. And unlike some of us, you actually have skills, mad skills. And so you've been talking about disparities facing Asian Americans in the healthcare system all day today. So now, how about taking on those disparities facing Asian Americans in the healthcare system? In order to figure out what kind of badass Asian Pacific American doctor you might want to be, it is important to know who you are, learn from the communities from where you come and from the communities that are around you, and dare to be a leader, an advocate for all our communities. First, what do I mean by know who you are? I have to confess that uh, unlike you perhaps, I. I never had any interest in becoming a doctor, nor was I pressured by my family to be a doctor, like many are. My childhood friend Xiaoma was the doctor. She always knew and grew up to become a pediatrician. That's her on the left. And on the right is Malto. He was always the test subject for our mud pies and medical treatments. And me, I was always the dog. So forgive me if, if some of my examples are too pedantic for you, but I'm coming at it from a different angle. But different angles are good. 
So aside from that, I think my background is a lot like yours. I was born and raised in California, the oldest child of immigrants. My parents were born in China, grew up in Taiwan, and came to the States for graduate school. Pretty typical immigration pattern. Uh, we spoke Chinese food at home and ate Chinese food. I called all my parents' friends, Ai and Bobo, auntie and uncle. Um, I learned English by watching Sesame Street, and I learned American culture by watching television sitcoms like Happy Days. I wasn't allowed to date in high school, and then later, I was asked what was wrong with me that I wasn't married yet at 22. The struggle, you know the struggle, right? And every Saturday morning, I used to attend Chinese school with all the other ABC, American-born Chinese kids. It seemed so weird to my regular school classmates that I remember one blonde girl stamping her foot and insisting, but it's against your constitutional rights to have to go to school on a Saturday. But the Jewish kids who had to attend Hebrew school on Wednesday afternoons, they understood. They could make the connection. And when I was in high school, Newsweek published an article about how Asian Americans were the model minority, naturally good at math and science, not good leaders. I was so naive that I thought that if it was published, it must be true. My father looked at me and said, China has a 4,000-year history. Who do you think was running it? It had never occurred to me to question what I read, what I had been taught, that there might be another point of view. Later in college, as I started living with roommates, I began to see that my parents' way of doing things was not the only way. When I made orange juice, I poured in the orange juice concentrate, added three cans of water, and then mixed it with a chopstick. Right? How else do you make orange juice? At first, my roommates laughed at what they called my Chinese swizzle stick because they had grown up mixing orange juice with a spoon. But you know, the spoons are too short, right? And you always get orange juice all over your hand. So it was, soon, we were all mixing the orange juice with chopsticks. At the same time, my roommates fretted about how to make rice on the stove. How much rice do you put in? How much water? How long do you cook it? Is it okay to lift the lid? They're really uptight about lifting the lid. I don't understand why. Um, and they, so I'm like, I don't know. Use a rice cooker like normal people. <laughs> and, and this is just an aside, but did you know that not everyone saves the blue rubber bands from the green onions? There are actually people who throw them away, and then they go to Office Max and buy rubber bands. <laughs> but we are not wrong for doing things differently than the mainstream. So even though I was a terrible Chinese school student, for some reason, I started taking Chinese again. Uh, at Berkeley, almost immediately when I went to college. I also took courses in Asian history and political science and philosophy. Those courses gave me a historical framework and timeline on which to hang my parents' lectures and my grandparents' stories. Before that, all I had were a few funny little stories, like the one about the time when my grandfather, who was in the Nationalist Air Force, got shot down and had to parachute out of his plane, only to realize he was about to parachute into a lake and he couldn't swim. Um, or the reason that my grandmother had such small feet was because they had only been partially bound, not completely. Just little funny stories until I acquired the historical context to give the meaning. When I came to graduate school at Mich University of Michigan, how many people are from somewhere else, not Michigan? OK, so you know. So I was still pretty naive. I thought of myself as overseas Chinese, or Hua Chao, and I still didn't know anything about other Asian cultures or about Asian Ameri being Asian American. Coming from California, I did not have much experience with being a minority or with racism, and I just couldn't process some of the odd experiences that I was having. What saved me was stumbling upon U of M's first Asian Pacific American Studies course learning about the history and the literature of our shared experience helped me realize that I wasn't crazy, that it wasn't my fault, and that there was more going on than I could see. Again, I learned the historical context in which my parents came to the United States. 
I understood the contributions of Asians that came 150 years before us. And for the first time, I read literature that reflected my own experience, like Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior, where she talks about being quiet in American school, but running wild and hanging upside down from the fire escape at Chinese school. So think about your experience and the collective stories of your family. Take those experiences and extend them to others. See the parallels and the connections. Often, these are the same stories and the same challenges, just accented by different languages and different foods. Think about your privilege. And as much as we fight against the model minority stereotype, no matter how poor our families might have been while we were growing up, we are all privileged in different ways, at minimum, because we speak English and we are educated. And that is huge once you recognize and acknowledge it. This is why whenever I find a Chinese grandma or grandpa who doesn't speak English and is lost or struggling to communicate with a store clerk, I always stop to translate. It only takes a few minutes of my time, but I do it because my own grandparents live far away and I can't help them, and because it reminds me what a gift I have. And as an aside, oh, I'll skip that. Um, no, as an aside, if, if, if you happen to have a pretty model minority background, and, and, you know, and if you can't see how invisibly privilege runs through your life and friends and reading don't help you to see, then run some experiments and put yourself in other people's situations to see what does it actually feel like to be in a place where no one understands your language, to have to ask for food in a food bank in this day and age, to not use water out of the tap for one full day, to be treated in a low-income medical facility where the protocol is for the staff to follow you to the bathroom while you do your drug test and then go and flush the toilet for you so they can make sure that you used it. And I won't even talk about the humiliating paper gowns and the ridiculous paper shorts. Also consider that Western medicine and, teacher, and your teachers do not know everything. When I was in graduate school, anything that was not analytic philosophy, that is anything that was not English from England, was dismissed. As Eastern, and anything Asian was Eastern mysticism. It was probably Oriental mysticism in those days. Um, there were many times when I had a hunch the professor was wrong, but I was just a student. I didn't know how to frame the argument or answer the question, and I certainly wasn't ready to take on all of Western philosophy, all caps. You know, there are thousands of years of medical research in these herbs, but it's just written in another language but many of them do work. Other, maybe not the, the endangered species ones, but, but many of them work, right? Or people wouldn't keep using them. I used to not believe, but my aunt dragged me to see all these Chinese doctors one time because she, of course, was convinced I was dying. And um, you know, they took my pulse. This is the way Chinese doctors do. They, they, you sit there, they take your pulse, and they say, okay, this is what's wrong with you, right? And they know. And, they, and then they prescribe all these herbs for you, and they were right, right? And the medicine worked. So the trick is to figure out which, tra which traditional remedies are useful, and then to appreciate the, cosmic, the, the complex cosmology or worldview behind it that might be informing your patients. Second, learn about the communities from where you come and the communities around you. My friend Ryan Suda owns a company called Black Lava that makes Asian Pacific American themed t-shirts. And one of the most popular ones is the one that reads, did you eat, means I love you. This is an idea that crosses so many cultures. Think about how many times you have gone to see your grandma or your auntie or your mom and they say, did you eat? And you answer, yeah, I already ate. And then they feed you again anyway. <laughs> right? There's no stopping them. Don't even try. It's a cultural thing, right? And this crosses many cultures. It's not just an Asian thing. So we all have that connection. So learn as much language as you can and what things actually mean beyond the words. I have three older cousins who I like to joke are the perfect Chinese family. Three sons, 
one lawyer, one businessman, and one doctor. All hugely successful and incredibly rich, largely because they can speak Chinese, even though they can't read or write it. My oldest cousin, the lawyer, was put in charge of the Pacific Rim division of his big law firm, primarily because he can speak Chinese and make pleasantries with people, make them feel comfortable. My second cousin, the businessman, does import-export between China and Australia, and he married into the Tiger Balm family, so it's like super rich, okay? And then, uh, so marry well, that helps too. Um, my third cousin, the doctor, now he also speaks Spanish because when their immigration pattern went by way of Argentina. So he speaks Spanish and Chinese, and he opened a geriatric health clinic in Los Angeles. Okay, you already know the answer to this one, right? He caters to elderly Chinese and Latinos who don't speak English, and he has a very long wait list of people, and they only want to see him because he's the only one they can talk to. Also read the stories and literature. Um, oh, and then there's, there's also, you know, language comes into play all the time. This is a poor uh, Indian grandpa in Alabama uh, who, was, who was partially paralyzed by police because he didn't speak didn't speak English, and there's no federal hate crime, crime charges because you should have known English. Long story. Um, also, read the stories and literature and authors of our communities, cultures, and countries. Uh, study Asian and Asian American history and geography. Find the commonalities and connections to what is going on in the world today and what is going on with your patients. They may not know that there is a connection between, say, exposure to conventional weapons uh, from a childhood during wartime and cancer today. And another non-Asian doctor might not even know that there was a war at that particular country at that particular time or what country the person's from. I mean, half the people I meet around here can't tell the difference between Taiwan and Thailand. So while you are... Oh, this one. And so while you are learning about our and other cultures and communities, challenge yourself to take a global or international perspective and develop critical thinking skills. There's no one right way of doing things, but it just so happens that American or, may, or Western culture is very loud all around us. So unless you look at things from a different perspective, you might not even notice. Always ask, who is missing from this picture? This is a much more difficult skill than just critiquing the results because what you're doing is critiquing what is not there. Here's a picture from the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. It's in every U.S. history textbook, right? Here's where they drive the bronze spike, the silver spike, the gold spike, all connected by telegraph wire, new technology then, all the way to Washington, D.C. But we also know that Chinese laborers built half the Transcontinental Railroad. But, and Irish laborers built the other half. But they're not here in this picture. You don't need Photoshop to make us forget as a society. Corky Lee's trying to reclaim that moment. Uh, during Hurricane Katrina, 30,000 Vietnamese Americans were displaced. But other than the Asian American magazine that I was writing for at the time, there was very little news coverage and even less social service help. The Red Cross just dumped all of them at the Hong Kong Mall in Houston. Oh, look, there are some Asians over there. Maybe they can help you. And Vietnamese American students flew in from all around the country to try to help translate. Also, if you have any sort of committee that is you know, supposed to be the diversity committee or the Asian American committee, look around and make sure everyone's there. If, if everyone's Chinese, you need to get some South Asians in. Right? If everyone is South Asian, you need to get some, you know, make sure you got Muslims and Hindus. You, you know, just make sure everyone is there. Always ask who is missing. And also learn to question assumptions. Who was actually included in this study? What other factors might have been overlooked? And what other options are there? For example, the standard recommendations, everyone should get 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day, or else you'll get osteoporosis and you'll be one of those bent little old ladies cobbling around, right? And often the doctor will hand you a sheet of paper with a list of recommendations of good calcium sources. In quantity, uh, and top of the list, right? Milk, cheese, yogurt, in quantities that would absolutely kill me. Oh my God, right? And then they'll, they'll say, it's okay. If you don't drink milk, you can get calcium from broccoli and tofu. 
You just need to eat 12 cups of broccoli or three and a half cups of tofu every day. Who can possibly eat 12 cups of broccoli every day? Right? Oh, and I added it up. Five cups of collard greens every day. That's insane. No, yes, four or five. So then I learned because I'm a journalist, so I I poke around in these things, uh, that Japanese ladies in northern Japanese fishing villages who don't eat dairy don't get osteoporosis. It turns out that one of the reasons you need so much calcium is because red meat leaches the calcium out of your bones. So you need to eat more calcium to compensate for that. So what if you don't eat red meat? What if you're vegetarian? What if you eat some meat, but not in the quantities that the stereotypical red meat and potatoes type of American would? What if you're Asian American, but you don't eat a traditional Japanese diet? You know, some of us aren't Japanese, right? So what if we eat some Asian food and some American food? Who knows, right? Who was in these studies? Who knows? All we know is the punchline. 1,000 milligrams of calcium every day, 12 cups of broccoli. (laughs) Pro tip from my my beloved Japanese-American Hapa pediatrician, there's a lot of calcium in those little dried fish snacks, but uh, I don't know why it's not on any of those charts that they give you at the doctor's (laughs) office. Often, when people talk about lactose intolerance, it's embarrassing because you, you know, right? And it's talked about as if, what is wrong with you that you can't digest milk? When really, if you look at it globally, almost no one can digest milk. Only just a few isolated herding communities, northern in Europe, Tibet, Mongolia, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, certain Indian groups, um, that had a genetic mutation thousands of years ago and thus retained the ability to digest, digest milk. Actually, when I first started learning about this, I had a, a cute boy, I mean a biologist <laughs> friend who was... Uh, helping me research this for me, and he found out that really lactose intolerance is a function of us being mammals. So then, if you look at a globe, really globally, at mammals, right, we're all born with the ability to digest milk, and then after we're weaned, we just don't need it anymore because we aren't supposed to be drinking milk anymore. So that's why you're not supposed to feed your cat milk, right? So when you look at it that way, it shouldn't even be called lactose intolerance because it's normal. Not only normal for human beings, it's normal for mammals. It's those people. Oh, I never get to say that word. It's those people, you know, who can digest milk, who are the freaks. I mean, uh, the exceptions, right? So you got to flip your thinking around. And it's, 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 uh, it, it, just flip it around. And along those lines, whenever working with Asian American populations, disaggregate the data. I've got a bunch of activist friends here. You can talk to them about disaggregating the data. The US Census definition of Asian Pacific Americans includes over 44 different countries and cultures, and largely comes out of the way we face the same kind of discrimination and prejudice here in America. But if you break it down by ethnic group, you will find that we are an incredibly diverse community, certainly not the model minority, but in fact, we usually have both the highest and lowest levels of whatever issue you're looking at, uh, highest and lowest levels of education, unemployment, health care coverage, poverty, health status, etc. cetera. So um, this is the not covered by health insurance. Look at the, let me look at, so here, this is the one. I mean, this is the number of Asian Pacific, AAPIs, Asian American Pacific Islanders, without health insurance before the Affordable Care Act. Tongans are 26%, Japanese are 7%. And the differences are a function of where do they work? Are they self-employed? All sorts of, you know, what is the, the, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it's a huge range. Uh, Poverty rates, when you, when you, Put everything together, sometimes it's hard to see. Again, here's Asian American median household incomes. We got Asian Indians at 95,000, Bangladeshi 46,000. Huge range. And um, often the way that you, oh, an undocumented, is this undocumented? No, 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 this is food insecurity. Huge numbers. We don't think of it, right? So look at Asian Americans, it's 9%, but uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, it's 24%, overall 10% of AAPIs. It's a huge number, and people don't think of that because this model minority myth, which incidentally just celebrated its 50th birthday, if that's something to celebrate, um, is, is uh, this, this month. Um, 
right? We don't, we don't even know it. We don't e no one even knows to ask the questions. And when we're talking about the undocumented, one in eight Asian immigrants is undocumented. Undocumented, you know, all the undocumented stuff. This is, our, this is a, one of our issues too, but people don't think about it. So if you're interested, there's all sorts of data, aapidata.com. Kartik Ramakrishna is on TV all the time. He is amazing. But oh, here's college degrees. Okay, let's, let's look at this, this model minority stereotype. Look at the range of people without a two or four year college degree. Indians, 20%, but Cambodian is 66%. Huge difference. Um, you should also, so, so data, data is great. The da always go back to the data, okay? Um, also challenge and deconstruct media and social stereotypes. Um, it's easy to see how absurd these stereotypes are with all the medical TV shows that have only one Asian in the whole hospital, right? Um, so here's one, one Asian, one Asian, one Asian, one Asian, Mindy, one Asian. Oh, Dr. Ken is the exception. There's like four Asian American doctors. There's Dr. Ken, there's his wife, his sister, Margaret Cho, and his wife's ex-boyfriend, Will Yun. And, uh, and Danny Purdy's coming on soon. I don't know if, I don't think he's a doctor though, but you know, he's cute. So, so uh, you know, so if, if they can't even, and these are all big cities. So if people in big, they can't get this right, you know, imagine the more, the more, I want to say the harder ones to see. Oh, Perry Shen. I, I was looking for pictures. I know Perry Shen. He's a he's, uh, but all the pictures of him were shirtless. Must have something to do with General Hospital. So I looked for a long time. I couldn't find any that weren't shirtless. But you know, okay, we'll leave that one on for a while. Um, but there are many other stereotypes that seem more benign, that have real world ramifications in terms of child custody, sex selective abortion bans, and domestic violence. Um, so Amy to a tiger mother, right? You guys would have been that age when that came out, right? A lot of us have tiger moms, but the, when this came out, I said, you know, this is gonna cause so many problems for people down the road. If anyone gets caught up in social services, they're gonna say, oh, she's a tiger mom. Let's take her kids away from her. And guess what happened? It happened, right? Nan Hui Jo, look up the case. I'll talk about it later if you want. Sex selective abortion bans. They say, oh, Asians, you know, they, they like, they like, you know, what, boys, not girls. They kill other babies, right? It's not even true. It's not even based on, say, once they did some studies, they found the opposite is true. I think it's immigrant, uh, Chinese and Indian, Korean, they actually have more girls than boys. And yet, we have these self-selective abortion laws and they're only prosecuting women of color as well. So that, that's something to look at. Look up the Pervy Patel case. There's great stuff on, on the aerogram.com. And, uh, and then domestic violence. The issues here, are they're multi-layered, right? They're issues of if, so say for example, a woman is being, uh, you know, is, is being abused. How does she get away, right? Does she, is her immigration status dependent on the dude? It, does she have any money? Can she get a job? Is she undocumented? Does she have kids? Does she have a way to take care of the kids? Can she speak English? When the police come, does the guy come up and say in his perfect English, oh, it's just a misunderstanding officer and just kind of talk right over her? There are so many nuances there that at all the different layers, we have problems. So, um, and then one of the huge advantages, uh, I want to end on a good note because that, that's my depressing part, um, is, is when you can look at stereotypes and read through the stereotypes and tell what is real and what is not real, right? You have a huge advantage and you, and you become a better doctor as well, right? I have a friend who's, who's at the medical school here and her sister in San Francisco saw a, a psychologist and the psychologist had diagnosed her as type A personality. And so she's telling her, her sister who's at the medical school here and my, and my friend says, I bet it was a white male doctor. And she goes, oh yeah, it was. Why do you say that? And he goes, because you're an Asian American woman. Asian American women, by definition, are type A personalities. That's just the baseline, right? And, and that's not a problem. You know, he couldn't read through the culture there. Anyway, so as you, as you uh, make your way into the medical world, dare to be a leader and advocate for all of our communities. You will need allies and you'll encounter trolls but we need you to create community and create change to help care for our Asian American communities and other communities of color. Pro tip, make allies, big and small. 
I grew up with few Asians and little awareness of being Asian American. Uh, the day I drove off to college at UC Berkeley, my father sat me down for one last lecture, and he said, when you go to college, remember to make Chinese friends. Oh God, there he goes again, trying to marry me off to a nice Chinese boy. Ba, I'm only 17. For once, that wasn't his point. He explained, the first day I join a new company, another Chinese engineer will always stop by my office to introduce himself and take me out to lunch. Chinese people will take care of each other in a way that Americans never will. Now that's a bit extreme, and he's, you know, immigrant generation, but think about it and look for, look for folks, right? Maybe Asian Americans, other Asians, other people of color, and form those connections. Uh, another pro tip, make sure the big bosses know who you are. Be useful to them when things are good. Prove your competence and your worth, and then when things are bad and you need their support, or maybe if they want to double check whether or not that yellow face Pearl Harbor party might be a little bit racist, they will already know who you are and know that you are reliable and you know what you're talking about. Another pro tip, since we're all so uh, beautiful, uh, dress extra professionally if you need to appear older to, um, you know, be taken seriously. And ladies, be careful of those creepy old agent files. But you already knew that. <laughs> and get to know people at all levels. Don't be so arrogant to think that you're so great because it is only an accident of luck that each of us is here today enjoying a Saturday afternoon of ideas at a medical school. Ask your families. There are so many stories of missed, about missed boats and missed bombs that changed everything. Besides, it's really the secretaries and the nurses and the other staff that make things happen. I have a college classmate who now runs the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C., and he gave a speech once about how things would be different if intellectuals ran the world. His secretary laughed at him. You can't even run the copy machine, and how are you going to run the world? So don't be that only Asian American in the room, ignoring that other only Asian American in the room, just because it would be weird to talk to her because she's Asian American, right? Support each other, because even when you are in your Senate confirmation hearings to become U.S. Surgeon General, you still might be anteed, that's a verb, anteed by some old white senator from Kansas. You ever been to Dodge City, Kansas? Oh, I have not, sir, but I would love to come. Well, good. I'm going to invite you because we have a lovely doctor from India. She's in her mid-30s and she's highly respected by the community. And another doctor from India that did my carpal tunnel when I did a stupid thing. And so I think you'd be right at home. We would welcome you. We have that to look forward to and become Surgeon General. Um, you'll, so you'll need your friends and your allies and community when you take controversial stands. And all the trolls come out. California State Senator Dr. Richard Pan, who's a pediatrician, wrote the legislation to close the personal preference loophole for vaccinations, which was signed into law by Governor Jerry Brown in July. There are a lot of other people in favor of vaccinations, but the anti-vaxxers came after him, and their attacks were decidedly racist. But in the end, he won, and the children of California are protected. Yay! So dare to be a leader for our communities and to advocate across lines of ethnicity and race. If you're new to Michigan, look up Grace Lee Boggs. She's a Detroit hero. You need to know about her. Um, but when the FBI, like she organized the, the March on Detroit march, which was two weeks before, or two months before the March on Washington. Um, and, but the FBI was so confused by her. Why would a Chinese American woman be working with African Americans on civil rights? They didn't get it. So her FBI file actually says that she must be Afro-Chinese because they couldn't come up with any other explanation. So right now is a crazy time of Islamophobia and xenophobia. Bullying and violence and discrimination are rampant against Muslim Americans and those who are mistaken for Muslim Americans, against immigrants and refugees, anyone who's brown. But it could be any of us. Fred Korematsu is one of the four people who challenged the constitutionality of the incarceration of Japanese Americans in internment camps during World War II. After 9-11, the Japanese American community was the first to stand up for, and they continue to stand up for, Arab American and Muslim American communities. His daughter, Karen Korematsu, is coming to the law school on Thursday if you want to come hear her speak. We are all in this together. What have I got next? So don't be afraid to dream, to live life, to love,
to create something new. Poised as we are between so many different cultures, we have rich resources that uniquely color everything that we do, from our relationships to our studies, our politics to our art. I think the key is that we all need to learn how to think and how to dream. Do not let society or your parents or fear make you limit yourself. Figure out how things work. Learn to think outside the box. Dare to take chances, get messy. Think hard, be creative, be courageous. And know that you are beloved and valued by our communities too. At the Ann Arbor Chinese School, many times older students teach younger students cultural classes like Chinese yo-yo. And if you're U of M, I'm talking about the revolution guys. Um, I've known them since they were in middle school. And so are really important role mo- you are really important role models and, caregiver- and leaders for the younger brothers and sisters and caregivers for our older generations. When my boy, Didi, or little brother, was four years old, he came running up to me one day, eyes bulging, and said, Mommy, something terrible has happened. Jeff Guga, that's older brother Jeff, Jeff Guga went to college. He was, he was, so, so remember that whenever you look out for him, for little brother or little sister, little, they stand When you look out for him, little brother becomes a little braver and stands a little taller. Thank you. Look how cute they are. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm here if you want to talk to me. I'm fine. Oh, and then uh, website. You can come find me at uh, NBCNews.com. There's a drop-down menu. Look for Asian America. We, we are the only mainstream media outlet that looks at Asian American issues. My blog is FrancisKaihuaWong.com. If you, we, have, we are fortunate to have the editor of the Aerogram here. If you, if you like South Asian literature and arts, we also have the, the amazing stars of the, the hot new podcast, Good Muslim, but good Muslim, bad Muslim. Sorry, uh, yay, they're over there. So, um, and and Lynn from uh, Mesa from U of M. So, so come talk to us. Thank you so much. Thank you.